Okay, so starting with what is relaxation uh, as applied to spins, uh, it is essentially a thermodynamic notion. So there's no such thing, at least thermodynamically, as relaxation for a single spin. It has to be an ensemble. And it's a process whereby an ensemble of spins returns to thermal equilibrium. And all of you, uh, chemists and physicists, hopefully remember the inversion recovery experiment in magnetic resonance when you flip the magnetization around and it slowly recovers. And then the spin echo, um, the CPMG experiment, uh, where you repeatedly refocus the transverse magnetization, but it still eventually fades to its equilibrium value of zero. And the principal uh, reason for relaxation is the presence of noise in the spin Hamilton. So you have some noisy process that jitters your, your couplings and your chemical shifts. And that noise has spectral power density at various frequencies. And if that noise has a frequency component at your transition frequency, it will cause random transitions, which are slightly more likely one way than the other. And then it will relax your system to the thermal equilibrium. And uh, in magnetic resonance, much of relaxation theory is associated with Al Redfield's name. Um, he probably wasn't the first to work out the concept in general outlines, but he was certainly the first to give a convenient and computable formalism for it that reduced to the real equations that are quantitatively correct and may be used uh, for highly detailed analysis. And uh, the sources of this noise, the Brownian motion, their vibrations in crystals, their conformational mobility, external particles, you know, random fluctuations of magnetic fields, uh, whatever it is. So this relaxation theory uh, has the name of Felix Bloch, um, uh, our Redfield and Bloch student, uh, Banks Ness, um, is essentially second order time dependent perturbation theory for a spin system that has noisy Hamiltonian. Mostly this is tumbling and translational diffusion uh, in liquids where a tumbling molecule uh, generates a stochastic Hamiltonian. And then after a second order perturbation series, you get extra transitions in the system, the so-called Redfield matrix. And um, the integral itself, the perturbation theory integral is horrendously complicated. It's really tough to compute because the dimensions of these matrices are very large. These are autocorrelation functions of the noise. Um, and I will not go into the technical details of how this is computed. Let's just say it is seriously difficult. And the usual time domain perturbative assumptions, the noise must be fast, faster than the dynamics. It must be weak, weaker than the, the Hamiltonian. And its correlation functions must decay sufficiently rapidly for certain separation of time scales to exist. That having been said, um, Redfield theory is highly accurate, unusually accurate for such things in quantum mechanics. Typically, you would be able to reproduce your experiments to 10% accuracy or better if all your interaction on isotropies and statistics of the noise are, 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 are well measured. So um, that having been said, the formalism is notoriously complicated for the students present. Uh, don't try it with pencil and paper. <laughs> it is not going to work it's like weeks of commutators. And there are plenty of errors in the published literature. So always do numerical tests before you use somebody else's relaxation theory expression. Good software exists. So in spinach, uh, the standard syntax, when you specify all your interactions, uh, there's an option relaxation equals red field and various equilibrium parameters um, and the various rotating frame approximations and laboratory frame and so on. Spinach supports every interaction. There is a magnetic resonance from, you know, electron zero field splitting um, all the way down to CSA and all of their cross correlations. And it also has um, a little collection of symbolic engines, scripts that do the processing symbolically and simply just output analytical expressions for certain relaxation rates within the isotropic rotational diffusion approximations. And systems with more than two spins can only realistically be done numerically. Spinach can do more than 10 spins and that's the only package at the moment that can do that. And to put things in context, uh, if you do it manually and analytically, it has taken Art Palmer in his famous chapter in the Protein and MS Spectroscopy book over 50 pages of dense mathematics to do dipole-dipole and CSA analysis for a two-spin system. So we are talking, um, you know, a highly advanced topic where really in most cases it's either numerical or it's not getting done. 
So from here, I will proceed to a few uh, road stories. So um, that illustrate uh, the various aspects of relaxation theory beyond what you would normally see in biological and mass spectroscopy where DDCSA and TROSI um, are often uh, pretty much as far as it gets, uh, either the, the perusian type TROSI or, or the K-type TROSI, the metal TROSI. So this particular story began when Barbara O'Dell uh, uh, just bumped into me in, in, uh, in the Oxford Park at, at lunchtime and said, well, Cooper, if you're supposed to be clever, and uh, Tim Claridge and, and herself, they had an interesting uh, spectrum that they recorded and, and couldn't understand. The spectrum was um, of, a, of a phenylaziridin, and it was a nosy slash axi, nosy on, on distances, um, and axi on the cis trans isomerization here. So this nitrogen would invert itself um, and move this proton uh, below the ring and above. And um, she had the dominant species in there. So this is one, two, three, four, the four signals of the four protons on this aziridin. And the tiny um, peaks in here are the trans species, the other one. And she predictably saw it's a tiny molecule in chloroform, uh, negative uh, NOEs because the sign is flipped on magnetization transfer in non-viscous liquids negative ones for the distances, and then the positive ones for the chemical exchange between the cis, uh, which is dominant here, and the trans, which is the, the minor. So the minor is not actually visible except for the cross peaks that come into it and come out of it. And here everything is as it should be. The NOE peaks are negative, the exchange peaks are positive, and, and everything is lovely, until they started cooling the system down. And the viscosity of chloroform doesn't really change all that much if you cool it like slightly below um, zero uh, or, or even you know, to minus 30 degrees, it's still liquid and not particularly viscous. Uh, and predictably lines get broader, but one thing that happened is um, some NOEs have stayed negative as they should, um, but some um, have become positive between positions that cannot possibly exchange, right? Like between that proton and that proton there, uh, or this proton and this proton. So we are starting to see strong positive NOEs um, between positions that don't exchange. For the viscosities that really must compel all NOEs to be negative. So suddenly they became positive. And so, um, uh, Barbara's question was, what is going on? Okay, uh, we ran the DFT on the system to get all the, the tensor parameters, uh, the barrier for this inversion, all the J couplings, everything. Um, quadrupolar tensor on the nitrogen 14, plonked it um, into the, the solver and um, concluded that that was not a quadrupolar effect because we had the same picture for 15N uh, labeled aziridin. It was not an exchange effect because those CH protons can possibly exchange. Uh, it was not a cross correlation because we had all cross correlations automatically accounted for in Spinach's relaxation module. And it was not a translational dipolar effect. We, we checked uh, against molecular dynamics and it certainly wasn't. So there we were staring at a, a strong positive NOE for a tiny molecule in non-viscous liquid between the positions that cannot possibly exchange. So what was going on? Um, after we did the post-mortem on the simulations, we realized that that was scalar cross relaxation of the first kind. And for those of you who might not have encountered scalar relaxation, that happens when you have noise in your, in your scalar interactions. And it's fairly frequent in EPR spectroscopy, in fact, commonplace. So scalar modulation of hyperfine coupling um, is often what happens in there. In the NMR case, it's quite common. Ralph Bruchweiler published an entire library on the subject of scalar relaxation, except nobody has ever seen scalar cross relaxation. Uh, and so we started looking at it. Okay, we thought, fine. Uh, there's this cis trans isomerization going on, presumably it changes J couplings uh, in the system, and it really does. Uh, if you run, um, 
synchronous transit quasi-Newton in just Gaussian against the DFT and map out the isomerization reaction coordinate for cis trans. Uh, you see that as, as befits um, standard, uh, you know, dihedral angle car plus relations, there's plenty of variation in the J-coupling. So there is noise in the J-coupling as a result of this cis trans uh, um, isomerization here. Okay, um, we did the mass. Uh, and uh, that's the dipolar standard overhauser, uh, and that's the scalar relaxation of the first kind for the cross relaxation component. And there's obvious problem here. This delta J is tiny. Right? The modulation depth of the dipolar coupling is, is 20 kilohertz. It's huge, All right? 20 kilohertz squared is rather a lot uh, and a sufficient amount of 20 kilohertz squared times the tau C is a detectable number, right? And so we have the cross relaxation. Uh, but of course, delta squared J is a modulation depth of J coupling. You can see it in here, 10 Hertz if you're lucky. So that will be a hundred. Uh, and it would have been completely negligible were it not for the fact that this nitrogen inversion correlation time is also very, very long. It's in the milliseconds. Uh, and then, you know, milliseconds times a hundred Hertz squared is actually of the same order of magnitude as uh, the overhauser rate. And so this scalar cross relaxation of the first kind is actually competitive with the nuclear overhauser effect. And to, to be fair, Azirian was in a soft spot. It was an exact is the right place. Um, so J coupling modulation depth is tiny, but the correlation time is huge here. So when you plot it as a function of rotational correlation time for the dipolar interaction, as a function of inversion correlation time for this nitrogen inversion, you can see the overhauser effect is negative as it should be, and it's always negative for all the conditions we would realistically have here. Crosses into positive for much larger molecules and much more viscous solvent, but this scalar cross relaxation is always positive. And it's in fact stronger for some regimes here than the overhauser effect, and it overpowers it and it flips the cross relaxation fix into positive. So this aziridin is in the sweet spot where the scalar cross relaxation of the first kind, I didn't believe for the first time ever that it was even seen, but it's also stronger than NOE. Uh, so scalar relaxation is ubiquitous, right? Everybody has seen it in both NMR and EPR, uh, but the scalar cross relaxation is extremely rare. And that's if you look at the relaxation super operator, that's the only off diagonal element there is uh, in there. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we published that uh, in, in Angivante uh, team. Uh, David Hodgson, the synthetic organic chemist uh, who made uh, the substance, and Tim and Barbara have noticed it. Um, and then the, the, the theory part and the simulation part, and it was, was mine. So that's the first story of, you know, things that you can realistically just bump into for, for small molecules in non-viscous liquids where seemingly everything probably has been done. But, um, you know, still, still something new because Tim had the courage to actually dig into it and um, declined to explain it away as some weird exchange effect. Um, and all of that became possible as a result of this relaxation theory engine in spinach. And if you look at it from the numerical perspective, it's also pretty damn hard. Um, that's Redfield's integral. And um, you can see it's a, it's a giant super operator valued Fourier transform, and it's really hard to compute. Um, the way previously to compute it was to diagonalize the Hamiltonian, and after a great amount of nitty gritty, it becomes a great collection of Fourier transforms. Except, of course, the keyword here is diagonalize the Hamiltonian. And if there are any quantum chemistry or spectroscopy people present, uh, they would realize that it's a bloody expensive procedure. And as soon as you've got more than 10 spins, uh, the dimension of this uh, Hamiltonian, it's a super operator, goes into the millions. And diagonalizing even 20,000 by 20,000 is a serious problem. Diagonalizing the million completely unrealistic. And so the only way we could get spinach to process phenylaziridine uh, was to find a workaround. And the workaround comes from the theory of Lie algebras and Lie groups, where there's something called auxiliary matrix. If you take a block matrix with blocks A, B, and C and exponentiate it, you realize that the corner block here is an integral of exactly the same general type as here. But matrix exponentials are vastly cheaper than matrix diagonalizations because exponentials of sparse matrices are still sparse. 
And so together with David Goodman, who was a PhD student in my group uh, at the time, in 2013 it was, um, we managed to implement uh, this for systems with Hamiltonians that have dimensions in the millions because everything stays sparse and actually port it to GPU and then, then all of that became possible. So um, that pretty chemical picture hides a lot of numerical linear algebra that had to be done before um, any of that became computable even to begin with. Uh, okay, so that was story number one. Uh, story number two came from Gottfried Otting, so the grandfather of Australian NMR, uh, you could say, who dealt with paramagnetic NMR spectroscopy. And uh, again, for the benefit of uh, the, the people present who may not have done paramagnetic NMR, it's when you put a, a metal with an unpaired electron into your NMR system, and a lot of complicated things happen. Um, individual signals are shifted, the so-called paramagnetic shift, by a lot. It's not uncommon to see a proton line at 100 ppm or a minus 100 ppm uh, if, you are, if you are lucky. Everything gets much broader, so lines can be you know, 100, 100 hertz wide. Relaxation obviously gets faster because of the presence of the electron. And occasionally, if you have very anisotropic susceptibility, you can have residual order effects. Um, a bit like residual uh, order from the liquid crystals that you would have in there. So things like cobalt, uh, most lanthanides because of the F electrons there, um, copper, iron, manganese, things like that. They have uh, these, these uh, paramagnetic shifts and paramagnetic relaxation. Husband. Now, this is useful because about a third, if memory serves, of, of proteins in nature are metalloproteins. Not all of them are paramagnetic. They would often have calcium or magnesium or something, but you can usually persuade that magnesium to come out and put a manganese into it, and then it becomes paramagnetic. Um, and there are naturally occurring paramagnetic ones as well, hemoglobin, obviously. And superoxide dismutase has copper. Nitrile hydrate, hydratase has cobalt. Um, and so this has been really useful because then these paramagnetic shifts carry structural information. But not only that, but also paramagnetic relaxation enhancements do. So these widths become really useful because they're related to distances. So these tags can be internal. If you just put a paramagnetic metal where none previously was paramagnetic or externally attached, if you mutate some amino acid into a cysteine and then attach a tag to it uh, that carries a paramagnetic uh, metal. So chemical shift is quite simple. It's really just a susceptibility effect. And there really isn't a good derivation in the literature. So I thought I'll put a nice, neat, modern derivation uh, in here. So imagine that's your susceptibility tensor of your, your little metal, for example, this prosium. And that's the applied magnetic field. And then the definition of susceptibility, it, it's the thing that connects your external magnetic field to the resulting magnetic moment that your metal gets. So just proportional to the magnetic field. And then this resulting magnetic moment will have a, a field of its own. It's a dipole, all right? And the dipole has a magnetic field and that's the usual dipole matrix, right? Times that dipole, the magnetic field that it has. And then that field will algebraically add itself to the external field. Um, and then uh, it's an extra chemical shift. And if you look at it, right, so uh, you have this mu E, so you put this entire thing in here. So your B naught gets modified by this matrix times susceptibility. And this is called um, the dipolar shift. And it's always present every time you have paramagnetic metal. Uh, and it's um, isotropic component, this is a third of a trace, is called pseudo contact shift. So just the dipolar matrix times susceptibility, easy as, as that. And it was Gottfried Otting that got us into it. Um, and um, it really is quite useful. So that's the diamagnetic chemical shift. Uh, you put terbium and the shift goes one way and you put tulium and it goes the other way, depending on the sign of the susceptibility uh, in both the proton and the nitrogen. And the amplitude here is related through the dipolar tensor to the geometric arrangement in here. And you can use it. And a great number of people do. Um, the Florence group uh, has made, um, I think, a couple of thousand papers by now of paramagnetic structure refinements based on the suit of contact shift. Importantly, uh, these extra chemical shielding tensors are strongly anti-symmetric. 
right? That matrix is symmetric, susceptibility is symmetric, but the product of two symmetric matrices is only symmetric when they come here, and they never do. And you would have a 100 ppm in anti-symmetry here. So first rank relaxation mechanisms become quite important here. Okay, so what about relaxation? It's basically just a standard dipole-dipole interaction. So you have one over R6, you have your usual dipole um, term in here with electron and nuclear frequency, and then the paramagnetic chemical shielding, it adds to the CSA. And then you have the extra, basically just the CSA type term with uh, the nuclear frequency squared, uh, a, a little bit uh, of temperature here because of Curie magnetization um, in that susceptibility. But substantially, this is just a glorified CSA against the paramagnetic shielding. Uh, and this is how it looks in practice. If you measure um, the, I think this is the, the, the nitrogen relaxation rate, uh, peak intensity ratio, uh, then in the vicinity of your paramagnetic label, you have this dip. And the paramagnetic relaxation enhancement, the conventional wisdom goes, is proportional to just the one over R6, same as dipolar interaction, because substantially both interactions are dipolar, both the direct dipolar and that dipolar shielding contribution to the CSA. Uh, okay, lovely, nice and easy, hundreds of papers on the subject, paramagnetic relaxation enhancement, and I think uh, Gottfried and company, uh, as, as well as people in Sayana, Diana, and other dominant uh, structural biology packages have the possibility of accounting for this in the structure refinement. Now, the funny story began with an email. Uh, Henry um, Orton, uh, a Gottfried's PhD student, emailed me at some point and said, Ilya, we have a bit of a problem here. He said, we added, we took calbindin, which just binds to equivalents of calcium here and here and replaced calcium with terbium and tulium and remeasured the relaxation rates here and the pseudo and, and the pseudo contact chips and the pseudo contact chips were lovely right so tulium gets it one way terbium gets it the other structure refinement perfect he says with one little problem he said when we take calcium out and put tulium and terbium in some nuclei start relaxing slower well, that was a bit unexpected because nowhere in that relaxation theory there's ever a minus sign. Um, seriously weird. And uh, we were like the people to email because in spinach we have a variety of obscure relaxation effects which are automatically accounted for. And so we plunked it into spinach and spinach didn't predict. So that was seriously funny. Okay, so we started digging through, you know, the deepest, darkest relaxation theory of where on earth can a lanthanide possibly slow a nuclear relaxation down. And um, the story was that there really isn't anywhere. So that's your CSA expression. And there isn't a single minus sign in here anywhere. That's your Fermi contact interaction. You know, sometimes electron can have contact density on the nucleus and through the scalar relaxation of the first kind, remember my previous story, that can accelerate relaxation, but everything here has a plus sign or a square. Uh, and so this can only accelerate relaxation, it cannot slow it down. All the internuclear dipolar couplings pluses throughout or a square uh, in, in here, uh, all the electron nuclear dipole dipole interactions, so all the hyperfine induced relaxation and so on, um, all of them have got plus signs. So it's an enhancement, never a reduction. Uh, electron nuclear Curie relaxation, so the other component, also everything has a plus. So all paramagnetic contributions are positive. Uh, if we account for all diamagnetic cross correlations, no, doesn't reproduce. It's bloody counterintuitive to, right? You add a paramagnetic center, relaxation slows down. It's not supposed to happen. So a lot of head scratching later, we realized that, of course, the dipole shielding tensor that I've derived for you a few slides ago, it adds to CSA algebraically before the relaxation theory, because electron relaxation is in the femtoseconds, right? It, it enters the picture before redfield theory even begins. Uh, okay, so we have susceptibility uh, that causes the dipole. The dipole induces additional dipolar shielding, and that dipolar shielding adds algebraically to the CSA. 
And for a few select nuclei within the protein structure, the combination of the tensors is just such that the dipolar shielding accidentally cancels the CSA and makes shielding of some unfortunate nitrogen more isotropic, not less, with the result that CSA is reduced. So a lot of mathematics later, so this delta squared CSA is now delta squared CSA plus the Curie term on it. And so the real effective shielding that goes into red field theory becomes more isotropic, not less, and the relaxation slows down. Uh, and then once we put that into the picture, I think I've got the graph somewhere, uh, uh, no, not in this presentation, this is explained. Right? So CSA plus dipolar shielding is actually smaller than both the CSA and the dipolar shielding anisotropy, with the result that one or two unfortunate nitrogens begin to relax much slower than they originally have been. So that ended up uh, in, 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 in JFU scam with the title of slowing down nuclear relaxation by adding a lanthanide. Uh, but something fishy was still going on, not in Gottfried's systems this time, but in a different project that we had on lanthanide relaxation with the group of David Parker uh, up north in, in Durham here in, in the UK. So um, when we did the 1 over R6 model, um, the experiment quite pointedly didn't fit the theory for a huge variety of lanthanide complexes that we had, uh, particularly in the immediate vicinity of the paramagnetic metal. Uh, and Lisa Suturin, a postdoc in my group at the same time, at, at the same time has done a heroic job of assigning paramagnetic uh, ligands. It's very hard to assign paramagnetic chemical shifts. But when you add second rank spherical harmonics, um, it improves. You add fourth rank spherical harmonics and the agreement becomes perfect. Now, that's also a problem because we're in a liquid. Not only that, we are in a completely isotropic liquid. If for a molecule here, that's for, a, for all intents and purposes, a sphere tumbling isotropically as well. So in an isotropic liquid under isotropic tumbling, we have an isotropic relaxation in the molecular frame. Now, within Redfield theory, this is not supposed to be possible. If it just works through the mathematics, it's just plainly not possible. It's not supposed to happen. Okay, so what on earth is going on? So within the standard picture, going back to Nika Bloombergen uh, is not supposed to happen, right? We have relaxation, which is anisotropic in the molecular frame. So not one over R6, but one over R6 times spherical harmonic. And not just any spherical harmonic, force rank spherical harmonic. Again, you know, most sensible in MR interactions, with the exception of zero field splitting. Um, and certain, I don't think quadrupolar interaction has ever been seen to have force rank, but basically just zero field splitting in EPR that has it, which is uh, where the hint is. Okay, now, so we had to go down, you know, all the way back uh, to, to Giron and Bloombergen. And um, the subject of paramagnetic relaxation has, has a, a long, it's a long story and, and a troubled one. Giron in his original derivation of the Curie mechanism missed susceptibility on isotropy, but it was thankfully put back uh, by, by Fiat and Vega. Um, so that, that mechanism was fine, but in the dipolar part, uh, it was really quite a mess, we realized. Uh, throughout the available literature, people were assuming that they're in the Zeeman limit. That is, the Zeeman interaction is much bigger than everything else. And in EPR, that just simply isn't the case, because zero field splitting can be in the wave numbers. It, it can be north of 100 gigahertz, you know, much bigger than, than any kind of Zeeman interaction that you have in there, you know, including in high field magnets. Uh, G tensor anisotropy was often unaccounted for uh, and the cross correlation. Difference between electrons T1 and T2, it's the femtoseconds, it's outside the Redfield limit, one has to do it. Um, various asymmetries and in various interaction tensors, rank one uh, things, various cross correlations and so on. But the principal problem was DFS. Uh, as pointed out by many people, um, using Zeeman limit was just simply wrong. Um, and then a lot of papers at the time contained essentially incomputable expressions like some overall excitations uh, in the electronic structure in a system that's an F element. And even today, 
you know, summing over all excitation, so full configuration interaction within the F subsystem essentially, next to incomputable. So, okay, um, if we were looking for things that previously weren't pick up by, picked up by any of this, we have to lift all those various um, assumptions. And so we had to start from the beginning. Right? So our original spin Hamiltonian um, has Zeeman part and has a zero field splitting and the zero field splitting is much bigger than the Zeeman. Now ZFS fluctuations come about because of vibrational modulation of ligand field in there. So electronic structure theory, essentially transient solvent coordination, things like that. Uh, things we don't know the spectral power densities for and probably never will. Uh, molecular dynamics scale things on the femtosecond time scale. But we can say quite safely that Z ZFS fluctuations, they kick the electron magnetization around somehow with unknown details. So we have thermodynamic equilibrium magnetization in there uh, and we have some stochastic process whose properties we don't know and never will. Uh, and there's this equilibrium magnetization from susceptibility there. Okay, so from the point of view of the nucleus, what the nucleus is seeing is its own Zeeman interaction with its own shielding with the magnetic field, plus this stochastic electron that it interacts with through the dipolar coupling, possibly also through Fermi contact coupling inside the D, so some isotropic part. And so we have a little bit of extra shielding. So if we substitute this mu electron, this one, and then susceptibility turns up. So this Curie process becomes extra shielding, pseudo contact shift and such. And then we have some process where it interacts through the dipolar coupling with some external magnetization we know nothing about. Uh, okay, so, so far so good. This all goes back to Bloombergen and, and Giron. So we redefine our shielding tensor to include the dipolar part. So if the molecule's rotating, there's a rotation matrix around here. Um, and then the electron magnetization is actually faster. Reorientation is faster than molecular rotation. This is outside the Redfield limit, right? Rotation is on the time scale of nano to, 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 to you know, picoseconds, but this electron dynamics is in femtoseconds. So it has to be done outside the Redfield limit as stochastic external field. Uh, okay, so for this, the Curie term uh, is pretty standard, except you have to add the first order components here and here. So that's the standard CSA and that's the first order CSA. Uh, thankfully, this term is uncorrelated with that because of the electron. Um, we have to account for the first order and the reason it's there is this asymmetry that I've already mentioned. So it's not just an isotropic, it's anti-symmetric as well. Um, this Cartesian form, by the way, is a lot easier to use than the trigonometric expressions for the various cross correlations. Okay, so what do we do about the dipolar coupling? If we look at here, there's rotation and there's the electron, thankfully uncorrelated. So to the nucleus, this is just stochastic external field. Uh, and for stochastic external field, thankfully solutions are known in terms of zoto correlations of this stochastic field, but we don't know what they are. We need to find out somehow, but the problem here is we don't know how zero field splitting is modulated. So it's some vibrations and solvent. So to NMR spectroscopists by now, this should look seriously scary, right? So we are way outside Redfield limit. Now we are in a, in a mostly uncharted territory, right? Where there's no time scale separation and, you know, the wild winds are blowing across the, the desert of um, you know, pretty fundamental physics, one would say. Uh, okay, so one thing we do know is electron relaxation is faster than molecular rotation in those systems. So we can at least split the rotation part from the electron dynamics. But you can see, you know, quadruple index summations in here and so on. And then we don't know anything about this. So we have to go back to the original uh, algebra of autocorrelation functions and try and work through them. Okay, so we'd say, right, we don't know anything about this autocorrelation function. That's the autocorrelation function of the electron magnetic moment in the molecular frame under stochastic zero field splitting. Okay, well, the only thing we do know is it's a matrix. Uh, and let's just call it G. So we'll sweep it all into this um, magnetic moment autocorrelation tensor and we'll just fit it, uh, hopefully later. 
Okay, and the rotation of the correlation functions we know, except that these are Cartesian, right? These are not Wigner functions. And Cartesian and auto correlation functions are a bit of a pain, uh, but uh, well, okay, we derived it, uh, used Mathematica to, to crunch through them. Anyway, final answers uh, are pretty neat. Uh, and it's still one over R6 uh, for the distance, but it has this electron autocorrelation tensor. So it's not just one over R6, it's one over R6 dipolar matrix times some other matrix, which we can fit. And uh, that matrix is the usual Fourier transform. So really the, the, the spectral power density um, function became spectral power density tensor which kind of explains why it became an isotropic uh, fitting parameter. But thankfully, uh, it works wonderfully well. All our data, so the black dots are experimental data on the corresponding nucleus, uh, and uh, the red are the dipolar part, the blue are the Curie part at that temperature, perfect fit. Uh, with nothing fitted except for the total correlation tensor, across uh, six different metals in 13 different ligands. That was a three-year project, um, that one. So it's not actually a cross-correlation. This has nothing to do with any of that, but it's, it's a different red field limit. Uh, it's when ZFS dominates uh, the, the H0 rather than the Zeeman uh, interaction. But thankfully, the final answers are still fine. So this lanthanide induced relaxation enhancement uh, for like maybe 40 years, people were assuming that paramagnetic relaxation enhancement is one over R6. It isn't, right? So with the exception of gadolinium, which is isotropic, so uh, a tweak of quantum mechanics, um, lanthanide induced nuclear relaxation is strongly anisotropic in the molecular frame of reference. So next time you are refining your protein structure against paramagnetic relaxation data, it's not one over R6, it's one over six times the spherical harmonic. Your fit will improve massively. Every time we try it, it does better structure refinement, so hopefully useful. Those are the expressions. Uh, accounting for the anti-symmetric, not just an isotropic, but also anti-symmetric parts of all tensors is essential. You can have a 100 ppm anti-symmetry there. It can actually dominate your CSA part. Um, the reason for all of that is electron is quantized in the ZFS eigenframe in those systems, not the Zeeman eigenframe. And it's not a cross correlation, it's a different red field limit. So um, Lisa did uh, all the, the assignments. Uh, David Parker's group synthesized uh, the ligands. Um, Kevin Mason did, did the NMR. Uh, Nick Chilton found an embarrassing mistake before we published it, <laughs> thank goodness, um, in that. So all the expressions are correct, uh, thanks to Nick. And Carlos provided some of the, of the ligands uh, that we also did as it's a testing on it. So it's a huge three-year team effort, but the final result is quite, quite neat for it. So how was this all eventually possible, right? So how can we package all this pretty scary theory into something that ultimately becomes simple? Um, the answer is spinach. Um, it's a package that we have for large scale uh, time domain simulation work, including relaxation theory. So take ubiquitin, um, 76 amino acids over a thousand magnetic nuclei, 60,000 couplings uh, in the anisotropic Hamiltonian, and say we would like a quantitatively correct noisy simulations for it. So full Redfield superoperator, including all the cross correlations for a thousand spin system. Here's the nosy. That's computed. That is theoretical. This is quantitatively correct. This is full time domain quantum mechanical simulation with red field relaxation super operator. Um, you know, all the zero quantum artifacts, everything you will have in there. I will not tell you how that's possible, right? How we reduce the matrices, which are originally two to the thousand by two to the thousand to about a million by a million and then handle them. Uh, that's a 10 year old, uh, 10 year long story. Uh, but this is quantitative, so it's all on spindynamics.org, and there's like 40 papers published on the subject now. So um, all types of magnetic resonance spectroscopy, NMR, EPR, MRI, all types of DMP, uh, parahydrogen, squid magnetometry, and such like. So this, I think, is a rapid passage EPR spectrum of a nitroxide radical. 
Um, that's the magic angle spinning quadrupolar NMR. That's a slice through somebody's brain um, in MRI. That's the magic angle spinning quadrupolar overtone on glycine. Um, it supports kinetics, diffusion, hydrodynamics, spatial encoding, so Lucio Friedman's ultra fast, um, pure shift NMR from Manchester and such like. Uh, by now, over 600 pages of docs, that's my Christmas occupation, writing the documentation for it, with over 100 examples in the example set covering the whole of magnetic resonance by now. So uh, the documentation is militant, so everything's documented both inside the code and on the wiki. Uh, plus a PhD level spin dynamics lecture course, over 50 hours of video, I'm writing a book uh, on, on these handouts. Uh, so that's me deriving, I think, rotational correlation functions from Fokker Planck equation from the ground up. Um, well annotated open source code. So if you look at it, that's high score. It's a cozy uh, kind of uh, sequence in EPR. So get the pulse operators, right? L plus is an operator of the spin system, L plus on the electrons. Or like apply the first pulse, rho is the step of the spin system under LX from row zero for pi by two, or do the evolution evolution of the spin system under the Louisvillian L from row with this time step for this number of points returns the final state or coherence filter. Rho equals coherence of the spin system, electron please zero quantum coherence. So this is easier than programming most NMR spectro spectrometers um, and, and militantly documented. And you will always see first the comment line, what this does, and send the sort of human readable syntax. I'm sure your first NMR pulse sequence on some variant had been just, you know, squinting at the code, trying to find out what it does, and then just editing it a little bit. You can do the same here. Right? So this is easier to read than variant, and certainly a lot easier to read than broker uh, and modify. So code quality and readability enforcement is militant there. Parallelized. It will use as many cores as it finds. It will use GPUs if you tell it various tensor structure tricks uh, implemented. So that's an acceleration you get from GPU about an order of magnitude and wall clock time. Um, the bigger the simulation, the better the improvement from GPUs. Various tensor algebra tricks like avoiding computing Kronecker products of matrices and keeping the Kronecker products compressed um, and so on. So over 50 people have contributed in various ways by now, 12 years of full-time programming in my group, um, all sorts of other things. I think this is the residual dipolar coupling clip HSQC. Um, that's a high score from EPR. That is squid magnetometry field jump on some dysprosium polymetallic cluster uh, in something. Uh, that's the relaxation theory for some radical in EPR. That's the cross correlation between G tensor and isotropy and hyperfine coupling. Same as Trozy, except in EPR. Uh, that's the powder pattern on quadrupolar overtone. That's some liquid state EPR in some aromatic radical. DNP in liquid state, if you flip the electron from negative magnetization into positive, you get the blip on the nuclei magic angle spinning DNP through one rotor period. So um, Bob Griffin slash Fred Mentin uh, style experiments and a lot of other things like MQ mass and Toxie and Rosie and whatever else is in there over a hundred pulse sequences by now. Uh, very recently we implemented classical degrees of freedom. So all the MRI stuff, but quantum mechanically that is Spinach MRI simulations will account for J couplings, will account for accurate relaxation theory, everything. Um, so for example, DPF GSE with explicit spatial gradients across a finite grid in space. Um, diffusion um, uh, tensor uh, imaging and such like. Echoplanar, all the usual stuff with, for example, variable diffusion. Um, so different diffusion tensors in different voxels, including different diffusion and isotropies and such like. Uh, Ahmed Alami's PhD thesis, uh, this one. So all other packages only use Bloch equations in the spin subspace. In the case of spinach, this is full Liouville von Neumann. Uh, it's actually Fokker Planck equation. So Liouville von Neumann, Kronecker spatial dynamics um, there. 
So all cross correlations, obviously, I don't need to tell this group what a cross correlation is. You invented methyl trozy if memory serves. Um, so that's the standard perversion kind of trozy where one uh, line can be much narrower than the other. Uh, uh, methyl trozy has got a lot more cross correlations in it and also symmetry lockout effects uh, on irreducible representations of C3V. Incidentally, spinach detects long-lived states automatically by diagonalizing Redfield super operator and looking at the eigenvectors that correspond to small eigenvalues in there. So uh, all of that is, 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 is there. And that's, I think, the final story that I have. No, not the final, the last, but one. Um, Hari Arsanari has at some point come and said, Ilya, can you do these fluorinated aromatics? Because I did a PhD thesis on fluorinated amino acids. And to my embarrassment, I have completely missed this effect. It never occurred to me it must exist. And then Harry found it. And thankfully, my thesis wasn't in vain because most of the calculations were already done. Uh, and so that's a trozy on an aromatic CH. So you have the trozy line and you have the anti-trozy line and the trozy line relaxes much slower. Right? So narrow line, lovely, but not like dramatically slow. You would have like 20 um, uh, hertz widths. So not an outrageously narrow line. What Harry discovered uh, and his group is that when you fluorinate that thing, the fluorine carbon trozy line is something like half a hertz predicted, extremely narrow. And these things were computed on, on spinach because in that case, it's not just the DDCSA, it's DDCSA CSA. There are two shielding tensors in there. And at that point, it analytically becomes intractable. You can only do such things numerically and we did. Uh, so um, Boston group did the NMR and confirmed that, yeah, for a sizable protein uh, at, you know, fields like 900 megahertz, you get the lines which are one hertz, five hertz, super narrow. Uh, that's because in aromatic systems by just fortuitous natural coincidence, um, the carbon 13 um, CSA is canceled by the carbon fluorine dipole coupling almost perfectly. Uh, in both amino acids and uh, the nucleotides. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a huge group effort, right? So all the spectroscopy was done uh, in, in Boston. My part was numerical modeling uh, of, of, of this. Uh, so uh, that's another case where spinach was useful. And the final story I wanted to tell you about is something that is of enormous current interest in magnetic resonance, it's liquid state DNP. And uh, the bane of liquid state DNP is that at high field, it doesn't really exist. The reason for that is this electron frequency in the denominator. So that's your standard over Hauser effect expression, and that's the electron frequency squared. Now, electron frequency is in the hundreds of gigahertz in high field magnet. These denominators are enormous. This cross relaxation rate is maybe millihertz or so, Game over. So Overhauser effect DNP is too slow to be of any use at high field. Except Lucio Friedman had a hunch. He said at some point he got uh, me and Maria Grazza Cancillo to sit down at one of the Euromars and said that he suspects that somewhere in the deepest, darkest cross correlations inside three spin, four spin systems, there could just be a sneaky path um, that would still make DNP possible at high field. We saw, uh, it's not likely, but let's run it. And so what we did was to brute force simulations. We created a three spin system, arbitrary EPR three spin system, two electrons and a, a nucleus and made all interactions arbitrary in it. And then Maria launched a brute force optimization in maybe 25 to 30 parameter space of that three spin system of steady state DNP at 14 Tesla. And we just left it running for a week. 
Um, and when we came back for a week, spinach found conditions where strong DNP, as in tenfold or so, in liquid state does exist at 14 Tesla here and in other conditions up to 25 Tesla and so on. So we thought, okay. Um, and then we started knocking things out. We knocked out G tensor and isotropy and the effect vanished. So it has to be a cross correlation, right? It has to be some kind of interference effect because G tensor and isotropy has nothing to do directly with, with DNP, right? But it can sneak magnetization around through two spinometers in a trozy like effect. So it has to be responsible. And then another thing that got us going is actually apparently exchange coupling, inter electron scalar coupling was somehow important. Uh, and we thought, okay, we knock it out and it disappears. And then the parameters that spinach produced were in, in no way unusual. That's your pretty standard CSA. That's your pretty standard G tensor. Some weird orientations between them, pretty standard rotational correlation time and a pretty standard exchange coupling. So it's only a theoretical prediction for now. We haven't managed to even start the synthesis of some things that would have these parameters, but apparently uh, high field DNP actually exists. And then we started doing post-mortem on that simulation to find out how it actually happens. And <laughs> this is what came out of it. Uh, it's a bit of a lot to discuss, but in a nutshell, it's an electron magnetization that um, a DDCSA, so a trozy-like effect between G tensor and hyperfine coupling translates into two spin order. Longitudinal paths out of this are all too slow, but there's a transverse cross correlation between a G tensor and a hyperfine coupling, and another transverse cross correlation between dipole tensor and a hyperfine that moves this into a three spin order. And then there's another microwave and exchange coupling loop that makes it a three spin longitudinal order. And then there's a third cross correlation, this time between two hyperfine tensors that moves it into the nuclear magnetization. Alternatively, there is a CSA to hyperfine cross correlation that takes you from here to here into nuclear magnetization. So it's a giant swarm uh, of off diagonal elements, a couple of hundred, these are only the dominant ones, but all of them either have a J0 or J omega n in the spectral power density, so they do not vanish at high field. And so once again, we've yet to cook a molecule that does it, but at least in principle, it exists. And the way um, we discovered this was two things. First is, I don't know how Lucio knew this, but he suspected it must be the case. And then Maria has run several weeks worth of brute force torture on the local supercomputer to try and find these parameters. And then it was my job um, to uh, persuade spinach to spill the secrets as to what just happened. And this mechanism came out uh, and it's now on our HIF. We sent it to JMR, but, but there it is. Okay, so final slide. Um, all of this was possible because there's now a black box package that does much better than a human would on both uh, numerical, mostly numerical, but we also have analytical scripts. Uh, supplied with spinach that do relaxation theory analytically for you. Uh, we do any kind of NMR there ever was, most kind of EPR and MRI, also optimal control, every kind of DNP there is, including magic angle spinning DNP. Uh, that was the code shared by Fred Menting, para hydrogenation CA DNP and KIDEP. Uh, more Lie algebra and uh, algebraic exotica than, than you ever wanted to know about. But this is now mostly finished. Um, it's free and open source, well documented by now. Um, and uh, well, you can see the, the effect. So that's, uh, I think, all uh, I have to say. And uh, I'd be happy to answer questions.